All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us here this morning. Um, as I already stated, we're going to go over creating an SSIS framework this morning. So, so let me just get the. So we're going to do a little bit of PowerPoint here this morning. So that's how we're just going to get things started. Um, once we get done with that, um, walking through some slides here, we're going to get into doing some demos. Um, just a quick little note: um, all of our demos will be done um, utilizing SQL 2012. Everything I do show, though, should be able to be done in previous versions as well. And if not, um, I'll try to point out um, where there might be some differences on where you wouldn't be able to do that in um, a previous version. So let's get started. Let's just start out here with a little bit of outline. So um, we're going to go over a little bit of why do we need a framework. Um, then we're going to go over what should a good framework have, um, as well as how to create an audit and configuration database, do a little bit of demos. Um, and then we'll have a little time, hopefully, for some questions and answers um, at the end as well. So any you guys, by the way, if you have any questions as we go along through this, please feel free to put them into the chat window. Um, Melissa will be monitoring those, um, and as needed, will be uh, letting me know what some of those questions are. So first of all, why do we need a framework? And one of the most important things um, is, is consistency. And what we're trying to do is not only create a consistency um, amongst our development standards, um, we're trying to create a consistent way to handle our logging as well as our debugging. And what I basically mean is that is we want to create one single way that all the logging is going to be done the same way in all the packages, meaning it's not going to be different in every uh, package, um, as well as give us, and once we have that logging, it gives us a very good way to be able to go through and debug things as well. So we're going to be able to go through those logs, we're going to be able to read what information's come up, whether it's success or failures, and we'll be able to get in and utilize that information in order to be able to do some debugging. Um, as well as a good framework should always have a, a monitoring ability to it. So once we're logging this information, we have all this information in one centralized location, we're going to be able to utilize that to monitor it. Now, there's many different ways we can go about monitoring it. Um, we could create um, SSRS reports that will go against that logging database in order to be able to show what's going on. Um, and in some instances, as well as what we'll see a little bit later when I go and showing how BI Express can help us, um, we can also create applications that sit on top of it that in real time actually monitor that logging database in order to be able to show what's actually going on in a more real-time manner. So we will have a couple different options about how we'd be able to go about this. But we do want monitoring to be part of our framework and something that we consider um, as we're going through this. So starting out with consistency here and developing and naming. So I'm going to start here with some naming standards. Um, you will notice there's a link available right up here. Um, this is a way to go out and take a look at this uh, complete list um, by Jamie Thompson. But one of the biggest things we want to be able to do is have a consistency as far as our naming goes. And by that, what I mean is um, for every type of task that we're going to have in there, as you see, like if it's a for loop container, um, if it's a for each loop container, if it's a sequence container, an execute SQL task, we want to start every single one out with a specific prefix. Now, there's a couple reasons for doing this. Um, one is so that we can create a, a naming standard for all of our type of object we're going to be able to put into place. And the second is that when we're logging all of this information back into some logging tables is that when we take a quick glance at that logging table and we take a look at the sources that the information where this is coming from, we're going to quickly be able to recognize and know what type of object actually sent those, that information back. So when we're getting information, whether it's about success or whether it's about failures, we're also going to be able to quickly recognize where that information is actually coming from. And here's a couple more just the naming standards as well. And one of the ones I do want to point out here is we also want to come up with naming standards as well for our sources. So you notice if it's an ODDB source, we're going to start out with OLE or a raw file source, maybe starting it out with RF. Now, once again, this is also going to help when we're trying to debug certain types of sources and certain types of errors. So by knowing what type of source, whether it's, it was an ODDB source or an Excel file and stuff like that, seeing something like a connection error, 
it's going a connection error now combining with knowing right away what the source type was, say it's an OLDB, saying it's Excel, it's going to help us immediately know where we got to go in and try to debug that information from. For example, it's an OLDB and you have a connection error. Um, it could now we're going to be taking a look at a couple things. Maybe it was a username was invalid. So we're going to know right away the user doesn't have access into that database. Um, but if it's a more generic connection information, like a connection could not be established, now compared to an OLDB to an Excel file, we're going to know that there's going to be different debugging paths we're going to have to go down to try to figure out where how to get that information. For example, an Excel file on a connection error, um, we're going to be looking more at something along the lines was was a network resource available, um, as well as even a user error not having access um, on an Excel file is going to come up as a connection error. We're not going to get a specified username access um, denied error in there. So knowing what those sources are and going through just makes our lives a little bit easier, as well as it helps when further developers maybe need to pick up work from when you're doing a team type of environment. Um, they're going to easily be able to look at the package, look through the information, and know what's kind of going on um, by having these consistent naming standards. So another couple things of what else should a good framework have is what I'm going to call is a flexible execution order. And what I mean by that is the ability that we don't have to set up giant master packages with every single package underneath that's going to be called. And say you had a master package with 50 packages that need to be called or run from there. We're not going to have to set up and modify that every single time we need to make a change. And when we go into demos, we'll see a little bit more about what I'm talking about here. But we want to have it flexible so that it's going to be very easy to move or change where a package execution is going to occur. Um, the ability to restart from the beginning or a last failure point. So what I mean by this is, let's say that you're, uh, we're loading a data warehouse. And let's say all the dimension packages process successfully, but we had an error when we got to one of our fact tables. Now, let's say we had 50 dimensions. You're not necessarily going to want to have to run all 50 dimension loads again just to get to the point where you had error during a fact load. So we want this to be able to pick up right from where our last failure point was. So if all those dimensions were successful, maybe even a couple fact tables were successful, we don't necessarily want to have to run those over again just to run the package that actually occurred and had a failure in it. So we're going to be able to do this, and we'll show in the demos where this is kind of going to fall in, is we're going to be able to pick up right from where we left off, and we're going to be able to start it and not have to rerun all those packages. And we're not going to have to do that manually either. It's going to be already built into our framework. So some of the things we want to make sure that we are logging are things like row counts. Um, obviously, we want to make sure we're logging errors. Um, things like durations, so we can start taking a look at and comparing things of performance over time. As well as we want to make sure this is very easy to implement. One of the biggest things that can always happen and cause issues is if we go out and we develop something and the ease of implementation isn't there, that's always going to become resistance amongst the developers. And it's going to make it so that it's not going to be something that they want to go about and actually use. As well as easy to maintain, meaning if we've got to make changes to this, we want to make sure we've set things up so that not only can we maintain the packages, but we can also maintain the framework in an easy way or the audit and configuration database. So how do we create this um, SSIS config database? Um, the first thing I want to point out is, is planning. And that is because we want to take the time up front, just like we would with any other type of project, to make sure that we've planned out and we plan out appropriately what we want in our framework and then what type of tables, store procedures, views, and so on in that audit framework that we need to be able to uh, put in there, as well as considering and planning where in SSIS are we going to implement this. And when we show some demos, I'm going to show some um, best practices of where in SSIS we want to actually implement this. So as I said, <coughs> excuse me, one of the things is we want to design the schema. 
So we want to go through and make sure we design the schema in a way that's going to support all the features that we want to be able to do. We want to continue to use best practices with the database, meaning that you know we want to implement stored procedures that are going to be called from our SSIS packages in order to be able to do things like you know logging errors or getting information about what packages need to be run. Uh, we don't want to be putting queries in SSIS to do that. We want to be able to use some best practices and use stored procedures for this as well. And then finally here is to realize that this database is part of your SDLC or your software development lifecycle. It, it's going to change over time. Things are going to happen where maybe you want to implement some more or more detailed logging. Maybe you want to add a new feature into yours. And even with this and this demos I'm going to be showing in the framework that I've used kind of over time, it's, it's evolved over time as well. I've added different features into that. And I'm able to easily do that because of how I actually set things up from the start. So the first thing I want to talk a little about is the config schema. And the first thing to think about in this schema, I have created something that's going to be, we're going to call an ETL process. And we want to think of this ETL process basically as the parent package or packages. Meaning it's that entry point, or that's where we're going to be able to start from when we're going to be executing our ETL. And it, this is the point where we're going to be enabling that flexible execution of the packages, which I talked about a little bit earlier, which is that ability to, to say, we don't have to specify each package actually in there to say, this one's going to run first, this one's going to run second. We're going to be able to actually configure that in the database. And then the second thing here is in our config schema is basically to think of is of packages, which this is just all the individual packages that are going to need to be executed. And in our schema, we think of this as there's going to basically be one entry for each package that exists. So as we kind of go through here in a minute, and I show you what the schema looks like a little bit more. The concept behind this is there's just one entry for each package. There's also kind of one entry for each ETL process that's going to exist. So here's a little bit of what my schema looks like here for the framework that I'm going to be showing. So as you see, we talked about we have this ETL process that exists up here. So we have some information about this ETL process. We have the ETL process name. We have some information about it. Is it restartable? In some cases, you might not want your process to be restartable. Maybe you always want it to start from the beginning. So if that is the case, what I did here is I just enabled a field, and it's just a uh, Boolean field or a bit field that we have in here that's going to show whether or not it's going to be restartable or not. Um, we have some information about is running. Um, that's just so we can know if that package is running. Because in a lot of cases, if it's already running, we don't want it to be run multiple times. So we can utilize that flag in there, and we'll be able to go in and make sure that we don't start this package up multiple times. Uh, was the last completed successful? So some information there, just letting you know, did it complete successfully on the previous run or not? And, that, and that's going to be a key amount of information that we get when we're trying to figure out um, if we need to restart a process when we're going through. So if we need to figure out if we need to restart a process, we're going to be taking a look at, A, was it, it, was it restartable? And B, was the last completed successful or not? And then just some standard create and modify dates that exist within here. Now, so you'll see down here under our package in our config schema, same thing, we have a package name, a package location, and that's the only two pieces of information I have right now in this package table. And the reason we have a name and a location is because in the examples I'm going to show and the demos that we'll do, we're going to be using SQL 2012, and we're going to be using it in a project deployment or an SSIS catalog deployment mode. So in those types of cases, we don't need to know what the location is because everything has internal references to it. However, if we were doing a file system deployment for this, we would also need to know where is the location of that package actually being stored so when we need to call and we need to be able to run that package, we have that information. So it's just showing that this framework is flexible enough um, that it can support either of the deployment methodologies that you may be using. And then finally up here, we have this ETL process package table. So in this process package table, 
we'll see that we have the ETL process key as well as the package key. So the purpose behind this table is this is a relationship table between the package and the process in order to be able to say what packages are associated with that process as well as utilizing this execution order that we have here what type of uh, what is the order on which that these packages need to be executed within that process so here's where everything here is all contained within the database to say here's the process here's the package and here is the order that they need to be executed in so we specify all this in the database so we don't need to go about specifying this and set up precedence orders and stuff like that and precedence constraints within the actual master package itself. We also have this thread number on here. Uh, what that's going to give us the ability to do is if we want to try to set up some multi-threading within our package, we're going to also be able to specify which thread number within that process is it actually going to execute on. So if we want certain things to be executed in parallel, we're going to be able to do that by utilizing that thread number um, within this database as well. So here's a little bit just bigger picture um, of the schema here. We've got our config tables, which we already talked about. So outside of our config tables that we've already talked about out here, you also notice we also have some additional tables that I've added in here that are consist that are in a log schema. So we have these config tables we've already talked about, and we've got some log tables. So we're logging some information like the package log. So within here, when the package actually its start and its end time of when the package actually is executed. And then we have a details table as well here with the package, which is going to contain all the individual detailed steps and information that occurred when that package was actually executing. So it's just basically we have this high level here, and then we got a little bit more detailed level here of all the individual steps. We also have that over here on the process. Same type of information. We have some overall information about the ETL process, when its start time and end time was, as well as a details table that's going to get into all the individual details of the executions that occurred while that process was actually executing. All right. So now that we've kind of talked a little bit about that and what it actually should have, as well as we take a little bit look at the schema, um, we're going to get into doing some demos here. And just a note, as I said earlier, everything we're going to be using here, we're going to use SSDT or SQL Server Data Tools. Um, if you're not familiar, basically SQL Server Data Tools is just in 2012. It is what used to be bids in the previous versions of, of SQL. All right. So let me flip over here, and then now I'm flipping over into my data tools, and you'll see that I have a solution set up here. So I have this SSIS framework solution set up, and I have a database project in here. So everything that's actually part of my database is all contained here within my database project. If you're not familiar with database projects at all, um, basically it is a way or to consolidate and be able to manage your entire um, project for a database. So all your properties of a database can be configured within here, as well as things like your schemas, all your store procedures, views, everything about that database can be contained in here. Not only contained in here, it can also be published or deployed directly from SSDT from utilizing a database project. Uh, I'm not going to get into too much detail about how that, that all works. Um, but I just wanted to explain that that's how I've had this project set up, or the solution set up, I should say. So, as you see, we have things like a config. We've got stored procedures, and we've got tables that are associated. Now, the tables I've already shown um, when we were walking through just a few minutes ago. And we have some stored procedures in here as well, things for, like, getting the packages by the ETL process. We also have some stored procedures here for inserting ETL processes inserting ETL process packages, inserting a new package. So just some overall store procedures to kind of help manage our framework. We also have our log schema that we have here. Same thing, we have store procedures and tables. So here's some of the tables that we kind of talked about already. 
Uh, there's you will notice there's an errors in here. I actually have to take that out. Um, that's something that's no longer being used. It was used in some initial uh, forms of this uh, framework that I put together. But we have some store procedures here. So we have store procedures for doing things like starting tasks, starting packages, um, starting our ETL processes. As you notice, we do have packages and tasks. So I have that created in here. So not only do we log information about when that package actually starts and the details of that package, but when the individual tasks themselves are actually being started within that package, I have a separate, separate store procedure to help manage that. And that's just because some different information needs to be updated. For example, um, let's just open this up and take a look what it looks like. When we're starting a package, I need to insert some information like into the actual package log itself to have things like when the actual package started. So you see we've got some get dates of the start time, the create and the modify dates, stuff like that needs to be actually inserted into the package log. As well as then we insert some information into the package details just letting us know the package has started. However, when I look at a task, the only thing I need to do is I need to insert information into the package details. So I just created separate store procedures to handle this um, in order to be able to tell the difference of when a package or the tasks within a package are actually running. Let me close those out. So this is just giving you a little idea. Here's some various store procedures that we have that are going to be able to go through and be utilized. So let's take a little bit look at just quickly here. What does my SSIS config or framework demo, I should say here, project look like? So this is just a standard SSIS project. And I've got a few packages that already exist within here. You see I have child package one and two. I also have this ETL process one and an ETS process one with threads. So as I go through the demos, I'll show you again a little bit more about what some of the differences between those are. So let's just open the ETL process one here to start. So under the ETL process one here, you see it's very um, streamlined, meaning that it's got some information here about we've got to go out and we're going to use an execute SQL task to get the package list, meaning I'm going to query the database to say, okay, what packages are part of this ETL process? And in just a minute, we'll switch over to the database and I'll show you what values are already in the database. So that's the first step is we need to get that list. So as we just execute a SQL task, you'll see my execute SQL task here. We're executing this config, get packages by ETL process, and we're passing in a parameter, ETL process name, and notice where this equals question mark. So within SSIS, if we want to be able to prompt for or do parameter mapping, we utilize a question mark, and that's how a parameter mapping will occur in an execute SQL task. You notice I have specified that the result set is a full result set, meaning I'm actually basically getting back a query result from this. So it's going to be as your typical multiple columns, multiple rows query result that we're going to be getting back as a result of this. Some of the different options here, if you're not familiar with this, we can also get either have no result set, meaning you executed some sort of query or some sort of store procedure, and no results are being provided back as part of that. Maybe it's just updating tables or something along those lines. Um, we can also specify the single row. So if you know somehow you are querying that information and only one single row is supposed to come back as part of that, we can specify this as a single row as well. In this case, we're doing a full result set. Now over here in our parameter mapping, you notice that we said we're package name where the ETL process equals question. And I'm going to utilize a built-in system variable in order to assist us here and to make the implementation of this a little bit easier. And what I'm going to use here is this system package name. So it's actually going to pass the package name, in this case ETL process one, back to the database in order to be able to say, okay, what's in there, what's associated with ETL process one. So this helps us avoid having to do any type of hard coding or anything of, of or setting up variables and putting hard coded values in. So the thing to keep in mind here is obviously what we put into our database, you just have to make sure matches 
what the package name here is as well. And when I switch over to the database in a minute and show you what's in there, hopefully I'll make a little bit more sense. Let's actually just do that right now. So I have my SSIS config DB. So let's take a look at what's in this database. So let's just take a look in what's in our config ETL process table. And as we take a look at that, you'll see I have a record in here for ETL process one, as well as this ETL process one with the red. And if you remember, uh, those were the two packages for ETL process that I have set up already inside my project. You notice there's some information in here. I did specify that both of these is, is restartable equal to one. You see, not running, so none of these are running right now. And the last time that they were run and the last completed successful was true. So let's take a look at what's in our packages table. So inside our package table here, now these are the two values to pay attention to. These ones actually aren't being used. And one of the things I wanted to point out here is, you notice we have child package one dot DTSX and child package two dot DTSX. Now the reason I put the DTSX extension on, as we'll show in a minute, is when we get this results back and we then have to say, okay, execute this package by using an execute package task, we need to have the DTS extension name on there. Now, when I do pass in though, and I use like that system parameter which I was just showing before, it would only pass in child package one. So I actually handle that within the stored procedures for get package and I just add right in there a .dts extension name to the variable being passed in. And then finally, let's take a look at what's in that relationship table for that ETL process package, which in this case, what we have in here, so you notice ETL process key being one, which in that case was that um, ETL process one package, we're saying package one, and here's the execution order that they need to be executed in. Basically saying package one needs to execute first, and then down here, we're saying that package two needs to execute second. And then down here, we also set up for ETL process key two, which was that with threading. You notice package key one and two are again in here. You notice the execution order is one on both, and that's because we're going to be utilizing the threading that's in here, meaning that they both need to execute first, this one first on thread one, this one first on thread two. Even though I have thread two specified over and above here, it'll actually be ignored because we're not implementing the threading in that ETL process one package that I actually have created. All right, so let's jump back over to here. Let's continue kind of going over how this actually works in this setup. So we get our packages. So now we're going to query the database. We're going to get that package list back, which is that list should now say, first we need to execute package child package one, then we need to execute child package two. And how we do this is we use a for each loop container. So I have this for each loop container set up here. And if we go in and take a look at how this works, the first thing we need to do is specify a collection. Actually, let me cancel that out. I forgot to show one thing back here, which was result set. So we have to also specify the result set we're getting back from this execute package task. Where is it going? And you'll notice it's going into this variable, and I just created a user variable, and I'm calling it process packages. And I'm going to show you really quick here, let's bring up our variables, on what that looks like. Because that has to be of a very specific type. You'll notice our var process packages its data type is object. So in order to be able to utilize this of getting a result set back and then utilize it for each loop, the type of variable we have to put this into is an object type. So now, oops, close it out. Let's go here into our execute packages for each loop container. So we, the collection that we specify is our enumerator is what we call a for each ADO enumerator. And our ADO object source right here, you notice is that same variable we used earlier, which is that process packages. Now, when you utilize this, you're also able to say, you, you want to grab all the rows in the first table, 
you can rows in all the tables, say you were returning multiple selects or something like that, you are able to set that up and be able to utilize that as well. One note you will say, it has to be an ADO.NET data set in order to be able to do any other types though. And then finally, we do the variable mapping, meaning we're getting a result set back here. And in that result set, I'm going to say, what is on index one is going to go to our var package name, and our index two is going to go into our thread variable. Like I said, we didn't implement any threading here, so that thread will actually not be utilized, but the package name absolutely will. So we have this for each loop container, and now inside of here, I have this execute package task. So inside my execute package task, now one of the things I want to point out here is, and I found this out kind of the hard way, was inside of our execute package task, we actually have to specify a package that exists. It, it's not saying, now you'll note, I'll show you what the dynamicness is in just one second here, but we do have to specify a package that does actually exist within our project in order for this to actually um, be able to compile or click OK and even not get an error here. So I'm just specifying child package one, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's what's going to actually be. And how we actually do this is, you know, so we have some parameter binding here. So the child package, so we're also actually passing some parameters into our child package. And how do we do that here is our pram etl process key where I, that I have here we're actually going through and we're actually passing a local variable here for process key as well. And I'll explain in a minute what all that information actually means. And do, 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 do. There we go. And then in the, finally, over here in our expressions, this is where we actually now say, the, so I'm using the expression of package name which package name is an expression that's already built in, and I'm passing this user var package name, which if you remember, we've mapped here in our for each loop container. So every row we go through, the package name that's coming back from that query is being put into this variable of package name, and now the package name to execute by going into this expressions for this execute package task, I'm saying get it from the variable. So this is how we add, we add the ability of being able to say, as it's going through this for each loop, change the package name each time as it goes through to what to execute. So that's how we get the flexible execution out of this and out of our ETL process here. But now let's going to go in and show, before I actually execute and show any of these demos, of where do we actually implement the framework part, which is all the logging and everything else that we want to be able to do. And how do we do that? The best practice for that is inside our event handlers. And the reason I say inside the event handlers is because if you were to do this, say, outside of the event handlers, meaning um, you were trying to call store procedures that were in a data flow task or as part of your process task, the hard part about that becomes is now it becomes a manual effort to always remember every time you add a new data flow is that you need to be put in these certain execute SQL tasks to make sure you do everything. Or, you know, same thing, every time you add a new task, actually in your control flow, you have to remember to do it there as well. And then what happens is now that whole ease to implementation that we talked about at the beginning isn't really there as part of this. However, if we do everything in our event handlers and we set everything else up one time in our event handlers, we can now create templates out of this. And basically, every developer that comes along just needs to take the template. That template's going to have everything already in the event handlers that we need to have there. And then they, there's nothing that they have to do extra on top to make sure that that framework actually got implemented. So inside of our event handlers, we have several different event handlers that actually exist as part of a SSIS package. We have things like on error to execute status change information, post execute, and so on. The ones that I like to implement here, as you will see, is our on error, our on information, our on post execute, and our on pre execute. And I'm going to start out with our pre execute. So you notice I do have this expression task. Now, 
this is a piece here that I do have to point out and say that this is something that can only be done in 2012. The expression task did not exist in previous versions, so you would have to do something more along the lines of a script task here to do what I'm about to show this expression task is doing. So within this expression task, if we take a look at what's going on here, is I actually have to do um, a little bit of inspection here to find out what's going on, meaning I need to find out is, is the package or is the task what's actually kicking off in here. And how I do that is I've set up just a local variable here, and inside this local variable, it's just called var is package, and I'm setting it equal to, and I'm seeing if the system source ID equals the system package ID, as well as the system source name equals the system package name. And what that's going to give me the ability to do is, so the system source ID and package ID, if this is the actual package itself that's kicking this off, they're going to be equal to each other, as well as the system source name and the system package name are going to be equal to each other at this point. So, and the reason I need to know this is I want to kick off or log the start of the ETL process only when the actual package itself is what's kicking off this event in the event handler. I do not want this to execute every time an individual task is actually kicking off within this process. All right. So let's just hit cancel there. And then here I just have this precedence constraint. And you notice inside this precedence constraint, I have expression and constraint. I mean, I have a, so what that means is the expression mean basically meaning this expression value that I put in here, which is var is package equal to true, which basically is saying that it's actually the top level for the package that fired off of this event, as well as just a value that completion of the previous step was successful. Oh, not successful, just completed. So by doing that, I'm going to make sure that I only kick off the start ETL process if it's the actual package that kicked it off. So the starting of the ECL process is now going to go in, it's going to log, it's going to kick off, it's going to set things like the start time in the database. Now, so that was pre-execute. Same thing, same thing on error. So if an error occurs and stuff like that, we're going to be logging our process errors. On information, this is just basically, so anytime something's occurring or this on information event, is getting kicked off, we are going to be able to go through here and we're just going to launch the SQL log process details stored procedure. So it's going to be putting into the details table everything that's happening as an information event is raised. And then finally, we have this post execute. And this post execute here is we're going to be able to go down here, same, it's going to have the same type of logic. We need to make sure it's the actual high level package that's causing this event to be fired. And so we can go in and kick off the stored procedure here of ending the ETL process. And the reason for that is we need to mark that the ETL process has ended. We're going to set our end times. We're going to mark that the, um, it completed and completed successfully. That type of information is going to be logged as part of that stored procedure. And if we click over here to our child packages, we're going to open child package one over here. I was going to go right over here into our event handlers. And you'll see this similar things that be done here, like on errors. Now one of the things I do want to point out here though is we have a couple we actually now have two paths coming out of this expression task. Meaning we have one thing going on if a package error occurs, and we have another thing actually occurring if the task error occurs. So the expression task here looks similar to what we already saw previously, meaning if that source the system ID equals the package ID and the source name equals the package name. But our constraints here, for example, this one, so basically the package is true, we're kicking off logging the package. However, if it's not or equals false here, what we're actually going to be going down here and doing is we're going to be kicking off logging task errors because different information needs to be logged compared to these. Like if the package error 
actually occurs, we're going to actually mark and log different information that have to do with that package, marking the end times and stuff like that on the package. Whereas if the actual task just occurred in error, we just need to log the details in the table and the error information and all that kind of stuff. And one thing I wanted to point out here in our parameter mapping is we are utilizing in this, you'll see the system source name and system error description. So what we're utilizing here is built-in system variables that already exist within SSIS to log information that's going to go through and say, for example, where does, where did this come from or what event or the source of this event as well as the error description for this. So we're actually going to use the error description right in SSIS and put it right into the logging table. Right. So this is why I, I'd like to say that event handlers is the best place in order to implement your framework basically for your logging information, even stuff like let's go through and mark that our packages are starting and stuff like that. It all right here in the event handlers. And that's because we set this up once and you notice there's a little difference for our packages compared to our process, meaning we would have two templates here. We'd have a template for our process and we'd have a template for our child package as well. And by utilizing that, what it's going to give us the ability now to do is we're going to be able to have both templates. Users or new developers come on or a new package needs to be developed. You just take this template or the base version of this. You just take it, you bring it in, and now we can start right off from that point. And all that framework is already, already going to be there. There's nothing additional that needs to be done. So let's kind of show now how this actually executes. So for ETL, I'm just going back here to my ETL process one. I'm just going to close my child package one just so for visualization purposes here. And I'm going to right click just on my ETL package and say execute my package. And what you're going to notice this happens here is it's going to get in my for each loop. You know, it's child package one kicked off first here. It just has a simple data flow occurring as part of it. It's going to run this data flow. If we click over here, you can see that it's still running. And once that completes, child package two. Now went in and completed and has simple data flow to it as well of just moving some data through. So you notice the order in which all came from the database, because in the database we said child package one was to run first, child package two was to run second. So giving us a little bit of flexibility as far as the orders and everything that we're trying to actually get everything to run in. All right, so let's get out of debug mode here. And let's close that down. Now let's take a look really quick before we take a look at the threading next of what actually happened in the database over here. So if we take a look here, actually let's take a look at our ETL process first. And you'll notice we have some new modified dates in here that just, oops, I'll take a look at that modified did not change. Um, you notice we're not running or anything right now. Last complete successful does equal one because it did complete successfully last. And let's take a look at, for example, like our log. So let's take a look at our log, and let's take a look at our ETL process log. And you'll notice we have some entries now in here from when we just ran it, our 1143 entry. It's telling us what our start time of the process was, what our end time of the process was, as well as you can see the create and modified. So if we want to do analysis on durations, we have a start and end time that we can utilize in order to do that analysis. Therefore, as well, as we can take a look at over time if packages were running slower and stuff like that. And if we take a look here from our log, our ETL process details, scroll down here, you know, see ETL process is completed, and we're getting information about final committed data insertions and everything that all occurred, all as this process was actually occurring. So it starts here with the ETL process started, letting our our validation phases were beginning, our prepare for execution, final commit for data insertions occurred, letting us know how many rows were inserted, stuff like that that actually occurred as this whole package was kind of going on. Same thing if we get it into here. If we take a look at our log table here. Let's take a look at our package details here. Let's scroll down. 
and we'll see we have our 1143 executions same type of thing it's letting you know that pack, child package one here was our source here's where it started see our log source now our DFT load sample like I said we're just utilizing that system source name variable in order to be able to get that information passed into here and we're getting details for example final commit has started it's letting us know how many rate uh, final cleanup phases it ended and you see here's where child package 2 kicks off letting us know child package 2 has started you also know there's package log keys here as well so you can be able to reference back to what the package log was by going into the upper tables and our various information here so we're logging all now centrally all this information so if we want to create reports and do things like that we'd be able to do that now as part of all of this so let's take a look at our ETL process one and our threading here so the difference here between process one and the process one with threads was you'll see that I actually have two parallel steps occurring, two for each loops, and the difference basically here is in our get packages. So you see as we get in our get packages, we're still calling that state store procedure, I'm specifying thread number one here. So I do not have set this set up as a dynamic at this point. And over here I'm specifying this, as you'll see, is the thread number equals two. So I'm actually passing into that store procedure and specifying the thread number. Now if we remember, and we can flip back over here just to take a quick look here. In our process package here, retail process key two, which is the width threading. So child package one should be on thread one. Child package two should be on thread two. So what should happen when I kick this off is both of these should run now in parallel rather than sequentially like it was before. So if I flip back over to here and I kick this off, what should happen now is in parallel, these packages should run. And there's package one and package two kicked off. Package two completed pretty quick. Here's package one still running. As you can see, you can tell that by here as well. By looking at this, you will see that finished. And now we just finished up over here. So this is a way to introduce some threading into this. I could have three threads, four threads, five threads set up here. As long as there's entries in the database already set up for all this, and we want to run multiple things in parallel that way, we'd be able to do this. Now. You could also go think about ways of, by using actually the SSIS APIs, you could actually write an application that sits on top of this to query your database first, dynamically find out how many threads, and create this package actually on the fly, um, or add on the fly to this package all of the threading that would actually be needed. So um, that's just some ideas to kind of think out of the box of some different ways that you could actually even expand this threading to even be a little bit more dynamic. Um, I have experimented with some of it. Um, it is actually possible. Um, I still have to do some finishing touches on it, though, before I'd be wanting to actually demo that out. So, but it is something just to think about how you could even create this to be even more dynamic and more robust in the various environments you might try to implement something like this in. So one of the things we did talk about, though, was restartability. So I'm actually going to cause a failure here. So child package two, I'm going to rename the 22 over here. And I'm going to kick off this ETL process with threading, which is going to cause an error. And you'll see if we click over here, it did cause an error. So let's let this finish up here. And then let's flip over to the database, just take a look at kind of what's in there. All right, so the package did complete with error. And if we go back over here to our ETL process in the database, we will see now that for this ETL process of doing the last completed successful is equal to zero, as well as is restartable is equal to one. Now I have some logic already built in to the stored procedure for getting those packages. That looks in and says, is it restartable? Was the last time a failure? If it was, it's actually going to go through and query through the logs to figure out in that last execution what was successful and not execute the packages that were successful, only execute basically ones from that failed or had not already been executed. So if we click back over to here and I re-execute this now, 
as well as let's rename this so it will be able to execute. The only thing that should kick off is child package two. So let's just close child package one and two down. So when I kick this off, we should see that the only thing that actually occurs is child package two, as you'll see, is the only package that ran. Because it's querying the database, it's noticing that child package one was successful in the last execution. Therefore, we don't need to run that again because we're restarting off from where our failure point was. All right. So I'm going to switch back over here to PowerPoint a little bit. So this is just kind of give you some examples and show. I'm going to switch back over to my PowerPoint over here. And do, 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 do. Uh, there we go. So now we have the question of how BI Express can actually help us now. So we've showed how to kind of go through and create a framework on our own, um, how you can go about implementing it. But how can BI Express kind of come in now in order to be able to help this as well? So BI Express um, actually has the ability to apply an auditing framework to existing or new packages. So if you guys already have a large, large set or large ETL processes that are already out there and you, you're looking at what I showed you and said, well, how would we actually take all that and implement it to our existing set? Wouldn't that be a very manual effort I'd have to go through of adding all these functions in right now? Well, it's one thing is you could go out and try to create something on your own, or B, you could look at something like BI Express here. And it has the ability to actually apply auditing framework to existing or new packages. Um, it actually provides a monitoring console as well. Um, it also can apply notification framework to existing new packages. So one of the things we didn't talk about yet really is notifications, you know, when things fail and who do we want to alert and stuff like that. Um, there's a built-in notification framework to BI Express as well. Um, I didn't cover it in my previous. Um, I do have a framework for that as well. I didn't cover it just because of um, constraints of time. As you see, almost used the entire hour up already, just kind of going over auditing framework. Um, it also can manage templates in BI Express as well. So that's just the ability to say, I'm going to create a template, and you can actually manage creating new packages from an existing template. So with that said, with the time we got left here, let's go in and take a little bit look at how BI Express can actually be able to use to do this. So I already have BI Express installed here, and I'm just going to create a new package. And in this new package, I'm actually just to make my life a little bit easier. Actually, I'm going to child package two. I'm just going to copy out this data flow just so we have something in here. Let's just delete that out so we don't have a reference issue. And when we do this, I just got to redo my mappings. All right, good. Um, a little tip and trick here, in case you um, haven't used this before and you're not familiar with it. If you go up to your format and you can go to Auto Layout and Diagram, um, it will fix and auto layout your SSIS packages for you. Um, just neaten up things like, for example, I had a big space and there's one to get rid of it. So a little tip and trick there of um, how if you struggle with trying to get your lines straight and get things to line up just exactly, um, you can use that format and you can format your diagram. So, all right. So we've got that. So I just created this new package. It's called package one right now in here. And as you see, this has no framework whatsoever at this point. There's no task and event handlers, nothing in here. I'm not doing anything with it. So what I can do right from within here is I can add my framework to this package. And to do that, all I have to do is I'm just right clicking on the package and I am going to do add remove auditing framework. So once BI Express is installed, it integrates automatically within SSDT or bids if you're using previous versions. And you get this wizard to kind of walk through of adding auditing framework. So I want to add or reapply an auditing framework here. I can also remove an auditing framework if that's what I needed to do from a package. And you'll notice it, when you do this, it recognizes all the packages that were in there. And then over here, we have our selected items. In this case, I'm just using package one. If I wanted to apply it to more packages, I can. So I'm just going to click Next. And within here, 
what we have to do is, this isn't my first time going through and doing this, is I need to create my auditing framework database. So it's also part of BI Express. It automatically has the ability to go through and create that centralized database. So let's just say I just want it to be my local server. I'm going to create a database called BI Express. So now I'm going to reference this database called BI Express. And when I reference it, I can do one of two things. I can create a new project connection in order to be able to use this, or I can use an existing project connection if I already had one out there. So I'm just going to create a new project connection here. That's a, whoops. There we go. There's other things you could do here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that as well is I can also do optional parameters in order to be able to go through here and enable and disable either entire frameworks. I can name disable very parameters. Um, I'm going to click over to my logging options so I can specify what I want to log or what I don't want to log. So say I didn't want to log variables, I could turn that off. Or if I didn't want to do variable tracking, or let's say I didn't want to log the SQL statement used to extract data, I can just turn that on or off. In this case, I'm just going to leave everything on. We also have some advanced logging. So if they say there's custom variables that you wanted to specifically be logged, even if, say, you turn variable logging off, you could do that in here as well. So let's just click Next. And when we do that, it's letting us know it's all ready. And to do that, we just click the Start button here. And what it's going to go through and do now here into that package one, And it's going through and applying our framework to our package one. Now, depending on different types of things, like how many packages you're doing, size of packages, stuff like that, it's letting us know. We're still reloading here. It is still running on so package level logging for on event errors. Of course, as just with my luck, I hope we're not going to hang up here. And I think Visual Studio did end up crashing on me. Right, we're right up against noon, so. Oops, yeah, the Visual Studio did crash up on me. Um, so since we're right up against noon, let's just take a look here and see if I recover quickly or not. And if I do, then we can continue. Let's see if it completed or not. Uh, that it did not do. All right. Whoops. All right, let's give that one more shot here really quick. And I'm just going to go through and just quickly do this and not explain everything. I'm going to add. We're going to reapply. We're just going to do the package one. Dot BI Express. And looks like we'll have a Visual Studio problem right now. So, um, so we're right up against the time, though, and uh, we're hitting about noon right now. And I don't want to keep anybody too long here. Um, unfortunately, running into a few issues with Visual Studio right now. Um, but what this process does is it goes through, and it actually goes through, and it adds basically a bunch of event handlers and everything into the package that are all part of um, this auditing framework that exists with BI Express. Um, and then 
once those that are all added in there, um, it's you have the ability then to even utilize the BI Express monitoring consoles and stuff like that that are built into the tool as well um, in order to be able to monitor packages as they're actually running. So um, if you have very long running packages and stuff like that, um, yeah, it looks like I'm definitely having Visual Studio problems here now. And it won't even let me hit continue waiting. Okay. Um, so let me just jump back over here into the PowerPoint here and just bring up my last slide, which is basically nothing more here. Then, um, so thank everybody here for attending our training on the T's here today. Um, see here some of my information available here, um, my email address, um, as well as my Twitter, and this is my blog address here as well. <clears throat> Once again, everybody, thank you for coming today, and I hope everybody um, enjoys well got a lot of information out of this session.